Hello there, everybody. This is Al Blumkin. Uh, I'm here with uh, David Nemec and Ian Kahanowitz doing uh, the show, uh, David Nemec's uh, All-Time Baseball History and Trivia. And today we're going to discuss the uh, 1911 through 1920 era. We stopped last week at 1910. So we'll start, and this is a very, very rich area. A lot of things happened, and uh, we'll start the show. Okay, David, do you want to uh, start it off? Well, we, like in, uh, as it ha- as happened in the first decade of the, of the uh, 20th century, uh, the second decade, uh, there were some uh, a few teams snuck through that hadn't won pennants in the first decade, but in the American League, uh, it was pretty much dominated by, by three teams. And, um, the A's, the Red Sox, and the White Sox. And, um, other teams, other teams gave it a, gave it a real shot at times. Uh, and I like to point to Cleveland, my pride and joy, especially. Uh, 1918 had the season gone its full length rather than been stopped at Labor Day because of the, uh, incursion of World War I. Uh, there's every indication that Cleveland would have won it. The schedule was in their favor. They were right behind the Red Sox, and they were coming on very strong. But, alas, they didn't, so it took them a couple more years before they finally made their breakthrough. But meanwhile, the Red Sox, A's, and White Sox were, uh, you know, pretty much in control of the American League. And uh, I know Ian and, and you can take it from there with the National League. Okay, the uh, first uh, three years uh, were won by the Giants, who lost all three World Series, and then they had a, basically a different uh, team winning every season after that for the rest of the uh, decade. Uh, in 1914, you had the Miracle Boston Braves. Then you had the 15, you had the Phillies, who uh, as they were only pennant win uh, until 1950. And then you had the Dodgers uh, in 16, the Giants again in 17, the Cubs in 18, and the uh, the Cubs in 18, the, the uh, uh, Reds in 19, and the Dodgers again in 1920. So they were, uh, you know, they were uh, teams that uh, the league that had uh, a, lot, a lot more balance than the American League did at that point. And you know, guys. You think that? Yeah, got it. Yeah. Oh, good. And you know, it's uh, just to back up to 1910. This began the era of cementing baseball as the national pastime. You know, we could point to President William ha- Taft in 1910 um, throwing out the first uh, baseball, also purportedly inventing the seventh inning stretch uh, for baseball music and. Uh, you had the parks coming. You know, had Kaminsky Park in 1910. You had Fenway Park uh, opening up in uh, 1912, and and, and uh, Crosley Field and Tiger Stadium. And so you had a growing amount of baseball with bigger stadiums and uh, more people coming out and making this truly the national pastime. Do you, you think they? The really took that long before it became the national pastime, Ian? Well, I think it, I think technically, it, probably after the whole uh, 1880s, um, probably 1890, um, you know, the revolution where they tried to make another competing um, uh, league, which we'll talk about the Federal League during this time. But I think, um, again, the 1890s were burdened by a depression. They called it a uh, panic. Uh, but by the 19, early 1900s, around 1910, I think people started wearing their, you know, going to uh, the Sunday games and uh, building bigger parks to house these folks. It was, it was ironically referred to the national pastime almost at the beginning of it, you know, the beginnings of it. Uh, in, in even the 1850s and 60s, there were occasional references, and by the 70s, uh, it became no, known as that, but I think you're right in that the 
the larger stadiums uh, were producing a more refined product and one that was more appealing to spectators. Uh, they offered more concessions, more restrooms, uh, more seating, more attractive seating, uh, and uh, there were, you know, ladies' day additions, and more teams were now playing on Sundays, but the Eastern teams, on the whole, were still not playing Sunday ball. Uh, so their, the schedules, as a result, were arranged so that uh, the Eastern teams were mostly, uh, you know, were always on the road on Sunday if possible. Uh, it wasn't always possible. They certainly had to, had to be home on Saturday and then had to lay over until Monday on certain occasions. But they tried to arrange the schedule to uh, accommodate the fact that uh, the East still held out against Sunday ball. They couldn't play. Well, Philadelphia and Pittsburgh didn't uh, uh, play Sunday ball at home until 1934, so that took forever. You know, yeah. To get the, you know, as I said last week, I think that was the, one of the big reasons that uh, Mac had to break up his team at the end of the, you know, the, the Foxgrove uh, Simmons Cochran teams because they they had no Sunday ball. By the way, uh, in 1911, didn't they live in the ball? No, that was. It certainly appears that way. Yeah, he, he, uh, there was, uh, you know, Schulte, you know, home run totals jumped. Uh, Schulte's especially, uh, you know, there were two 400 batting averages. Uh, is, I think was Jackson's the only one that didn't win a batting title, or is that? Yeah, I think there were. I think there were, and then well, in the 19th century, there was certainly true. Oh, in Cobb, uh, several. It depends on what you consider what Cobb was credited for in 1922, because that's in dispute. That's true, too, yeah. Yeah. And uh, so well, that's in dispute, so it's, uh, uh, you know, if he's considered then, then he he, he lost his sister. Uh, yeah. That year with a 400 average, but that obviously was, you know, may, may, as Jackson at 408, and I think that was the year when the Giants as a team stole over 300 bases. In 1940, uh, 1911. They did, yeah. Yeah, and they were uh, still playing a different brand of ball than some of the other teams. Yeah, well, McGraw really didn't change, and uh, uh, yeah, they, as I mentioned uh, a couple of seconds ago, they lost the uh, three to uh, three World Series in a row to uh, uh, the eleven to the A's, thirteen to the A's again, and middle twelve to the Red Sox, which is a very memorable World Series, and uh, the fact that season in the American League was really memorable because not only did Boston win, but you had uh, you know, Walter Johnson and uh, Smokey Joe Wood basically at their peaks. Yeah. Yeah, uh, there was... Go, go ahead, Ian. Yeah. But I got that. Yeah, that's all right. I got it. No... Well, I, yeah. I'm just going to say uh, that uh, Johnson's appearance uh, on the scene, uh, which had come near the end of the first decade of the 20th century, by the by the early teens was starting to really pay off, and he was the first uh, real superstar in, to ever ever to appear in a Washington uniform for any length of time. Delahanty played very briefly with Washington, but. Johnson was was uh, you know one of a kind, and he, he almost all single handedly. Uh, certainly, he had help, but I mean, there was nobody near his stature uh, helping that team uh, advance into contention at times during the uh, during the teens. Although they certainly suffered lean years too, but uh, he was really really became the dominant pitcher by. Uh, by 1911, 1912, and Wood Wood gave him a run in 1912. But after that, uh, Johnson really yeah, Wood hurt his arm, and uh, you know uh, before the season opened in uh, yeah 1913, yeah. and uh, yeah he uh, he wound up uh, uh, converting himself into an outfielder and played uh, fairly decently for for a number of years. He was very good friends with uh, Tris Speaker, who. Uh, you know, when the speaker became a player manager over in the Cleveland, uh, Joe Wood uh, went there to play. And uh, yeah, there was an outfielder. Yeah. And a good one. And, 
you know, Christy Mackison uh, during that period, I think, lost the five World Series games, including the, the two to the A's in uh, 19, two to the, I think it was one, one or two to the A's in 1911, uh, two to the Red Sox in 1912, including that last game, which uh, Fred Snodgrass got, uh, you know, similarly to Merkel, a giant outfielder who uh, made an error in the top of the 10th, uh, then made a sensational catch, and then the uh, speaker came up, in the, uh, and uh, a foul ball fell between Mathison, the catcher, Chief Myers, and uh, Merkel at first base. And the uh, speaker then got the hit that drove him to the run in the eighth game. There was a tie game in that series. Yeah, that's, uh, that was a very memorable ending. And, again, uh, the Giants were on the short end of it. Uh, yeah, and I think really 1911 was where home run Baker got his nickname because he had the game-winning home runs off uh, Mark Wynn and Matheson. And uh, that's how he got his nickname. Now, here's something about 1911, guys, that not a lot of people know. Um, again, you got to put into perspective in the National League, you know, the Cubs ran, you know, the Cubs ran their course in uh, 19, as we mentioned. But for the Giants, what people don't know is on April 14th, the Polo Grounds uh, caught fire and was extensively damaged in 1911. And the Giants ended up playing the remainder of the season at Highlander Park, which is the home of the Yankees. And normally such an event would really hurt a team, uh, but uh, McGraw was able to, uh, you know, and they still have the fans behind them. You had Christy Matheson and Rube McCard, which uh, won the National League by, you know, seven and a half games. And it was even made even more possible because the Cubs, uh, we mentioned before, like, uh, uh, they mentioned uh, the ball was a lively. You had uh, Jim Doyle hitting 21 home runs. And you had a great pitcher in three thing of uh, Mordecai Brown over there in Chicago. Yeah, well, one of the things is you brought this up that the, after the 1912 season, uh, uh, Hilltop Park was run away with, and the Yankees moved into the polo grounds where they would stay until uh, their tenants became tenants of the Giants, uh, and they would stay there until uh, the Yankee, Yankee Stadium opened up in 19. 19- 23. And uh, in the 1913, the rumblings and uh, were uh, started about the uh, the th- third major league, uh, the Federal League, which operated not, not, not as a major league in 1913, but declared itself a major league in 1914 and uh, was not accepted by, uh, you know, the... Uh, uh, so-called organized baseball, and uh, they did manage to uh, uh, take uh, a number of players away from the major leagues, and uh, they lasted for two two years. And what, one of the things that happened there with the, the Federal League was that the uh, uh, American League and National League uh, started giving more money to the star players uh, to prevent them from jumping. The only time really before uh, you know, the free agency decision in 1976 that this really happened was when the American League came in in 1903 and when the uh, uh, Federal League was uh, created in 1914. But they did take, uh, and uh, in 1914, the A's won the pennant again, but uh, a number of their players were uh, all set to jump, especially their pitchers. Uh, Plank and Bender, and, uh, you know, the Braves had come back uh, from uh, 11 and a half down on July 4th, which was not really all that fantastic a deficit uh, with uh, with a couple months left, and they wound up winning the pennant, and they won the World Series in four straight, and there are a number of people who believe that the A's uh, didn't exactly put out the greatest effort in the world in trying to win that World Series. Hmm. You, you heard that that uh, argument uh, uh, being has absolutely, absolutely, and I think there probably is validity to it. Uh, that team uh, really, really 
uh, went into the went into the dumpster after that World Series, and uh, you know it's uh, I I've never been a big Connie Mack fan, and uh, yeah I can I like to harken back to the 1911 series for a moment. Uh, there was a play uh, a play at uh, the Polo Grounds. Uh, when the and the, the game was tied and in uh, in the uh, and, and um, Larry Doyle was on third base for the Giants, carrying the potential winning run if somebody could bring him in. And uh, Fred Merkel hit a fly ball near the right field line. Uh, I think Danny Murphy made the catch, threw home, uh, not in time to get Doyle, but Doyle, Doyle sw- slid and missed the plate. And, uh, there was, you know, and Bill Clem, the ump, home plate umpire, uh, who was watching the play carefully, normally as soon as the winning run scored, as it had in this case, seemingly, uh, immediately left the field, especially because in those days the crowd thronged onto the field as soon as the game was over, which, which did indeed happen in the polo grounds that day. But Clem hung around, uh, and went, and until the field was cleared. And uh, then at that point, uh, walked away. But meanwhile, the A's, some of the A's had seen uh, Doyle miss the plate, one of whom was Connie Mack, the manager. And Mack uh, refused to, or, or so he said later, I, I would not have, have deigned to uh, make an appeal on that play because after all, he, would, he could have been safe. I mean, he would have been safe if he had come back and tagged the plate. Uh, but he, of course, he didn't, and uh, you know, I just wouldn't. That would, that's not the gentlemanly way to play the game. Now, I don't think John McGraw would have agreed with that. Uh, no. It would have been interesting if Mac had made that appeal, yeah. and Doyle had been declared out. Whether anybody would have made it, any of the A's or Clem would have made it out alive from that park, and that may may indeed have been uh, part of Mac's reasoning, but uh, it's certainly not what he said later. And um, I, just, I just never, I never really felt comfortable about the way Connie Mack managed. And uh, looking back, well, only because of what I read about it, I did see games that, that he managed uh, when I was a kid. Well, I he was like a six years old when he, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, when he, and he was he was a fixture in the dugout, literally yeah. a fixture. Al Simmons pretty much ran the team, but uh, you know that's. Um, I remember as a kid reading about that play at the plate and, you know, comparing it to the Merkel play. And, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting that McGraw was involved in both, both games and was, co- and was coaching third base actually in both games. Uh, and, uh, was actually could have, you know, we talked about this last week, how much responsibility he should have borne for Merkel's failure to, uh, proceed to second base on Bridwell's single to center field with a, to bring in the, what seemingly was a winning run. Uh, so here are the two two managers who are were probably the most revered managers, in, you know, historically from that era, and they man, their, their managing styles were a total contrast. Their personalities were a total contrast. And even though you know both are regarded very highly by historians, I've I've always had trouble with that in both cases. Oh. Uh... You know, uh, well, after 1914, uh, you know, McGraw gutted the team. He sold uh, Eddie Collins to the White Sox, and he, I think by, by the time uh, 1915 rolled around, that uh, uh, Stuffy McGinnis was the only regular player left there. Yeah. And uh, and they, uh, that they, I think, went from winning the American League pennant to 43 wins, and it got even worse the next year. Uh, when they went 36 and 117, as I mentioned, uh, I think last week there was a book that came out a couple of years ago that goes day by day through the uh, 1916-A season called As Bad As It Gets. And it was basically like reading a book about the 1962 Mets. <laughs> this team was just absolutely brutal. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and the Red Sox uh, had taken over as the primary team in the American League. They won in 1915, and they played the Phillies. The uh, Phillies uh, now were playing in uh, Baker Bowl, which was one of the most 
you know, the, one of the toughest pitchers parks uh, in history. And uh, somehow Grover Cleveland Alexander, who came up there in 1911, had seven seasons before he went into the uh, military in 1918. That, to me, is just beyond belief. How he could pitch that well in a place like that it, you know, is, to me, almost incomprehensible. And did he have 16 shutouts that year? Yeah, 1915 or 16 he had that. I forget what year. And do you have any comments on Alexander? Yeah, Alexander won 31 games in uh, in uh, 1915, and um, you know, and Gabby uh, Kravitz had a lead leading uh, 24 home runs. Um, so you know, Philadelphia, uh, whereas the A's were pretty much old and crumbling, you had a new Philadelphia uh, resurgence. Uh, Grover Cleveland Alexander is probably. Uh, one of the better uh, pitchers in the era, when they, in, in, a, in an era where there was pitching, and it lasted, I believe, well into the 1920s. Well, I think he was. I think, it's, I, my, it's my personal opinion that he was. Uh, he was. I liked him better than I liked Christy Mackison. Oh, I, I, I like he, him the be, I think I like him the best of any of, of the pitchers in that era. Uh, he never, at any point, played for a really a really strong team for any length of time. Uh, he when he was on the Cubs, uh, you know, traded the Cubs. He could he was taken into the Army, so he missed the 1918 pennant and series. Uh, he eventually ended up in the 26 Cardinals near the end of his career, and the 15 Phillies were a fluke. So he's never really on a very on a dominant team, but he was really a very dominant pitcher for a long, long time. And I, I think if not for what happened to him in World War One, he was gassed. Uh, as Matthewson was too, and uh, for Matthewson it ultimately cost him his life. For Ma- for Alexander it almost cost him his sanity. I think it is what drove him more to become an alcoholic than anything else. Uh, yeah, the, the end yeah. of his career, and it certainly shortened it. In 1915, the Red Sox uh, started their uh, nomination for the next several years in the American League. And with uh, Trish Speaker and uh, you know, playing center field, they had the the outfield of Duffy Lewis, uh, Trish Speaker, and another Hall of Famer, uh, Harry Hooper. And uh, they brought this kid up at, toward the end of 1914, this kid pitcher from Providence uh, and Baltimore in the uh, International League. And his name was George Herman Roof. Who would later go on to, uh, you know, <laughs> become the most important uh, player in the, uh, uh, with the possible exception of Jackie Robinson in the uh, history of baseball in the 20th century. And uh, Ruth Starr is a pitcher, and he was so good a pitcher that he, uh, you know, who was a 20 game winner several times. He led the league in the uh, under average uh, once, and he won, the, he pitched the, Set the record at the time, which has since been broken by Lady Ford, of uh, the 29 two third scoreless innings in uh, World Series play. And uh, in 1916, uh, for some still unexplained reason, uh, the Red Sox sold Trish Speaker uh, to Cleveland right before the season started, and uh, and Cleveland. Uh, I uh, messed that up the year before when they sent Joe Jackson to the White Sox for an outfield named Brad Roth, who I think led the league in home runs one year. But yeah, they read, they read, I think a couple other guys came came along with Roth, but nothing of any consequence. And uh, and uh, the Red Sox uh, repeated in 1916, and uh, Brooklyn for the first time. Uh, by that time. Uh, Wilbur Robertson and uh, John McGraw did not get along. And that was the first time that Wilbur Robertson ever beat John McGraw, and I was really wild about the uh, 1916 Giants, is that they had uh, two incredible winning streaks of 17 and 26, both of which uh, were all home games, and they still wound up in fourth place. And the year before, the Giants, interestingly enough, finished in the cellar under McGraw uh, for the only time in their history under McGraw's managership. 
but they did produce uh, the greatest seller winning seller uh, winning team ever. They won 69 games and lost 83 for a 454 winning percentage, uh, and it's, 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 it adds to uh, McGraw's very checkered and yet remarkable. Uh, you know, portfolio as a man, both a player and a manager. He had some, you know, wild swing, wild contrasts, and uh, I've still to this day tried to determine if McGraw was the first manager ever to sit, uh, to take himself off the field of play as a coach and sit on the bench in uniform. Uh, it's never been determined by anyone, to my knowledge, who the first manager was to do it. But I have a suspicion that it was McGraw, and that 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 too just adds to uh, the many many interesting things about him. And, also, uh, the uh, one of the things I wanted to bring up was that the American League had a nail biting race in 1916, where uh, the Red Sox had won, won 101 games, and they beat the Tigers out by one game, and that was the closest that Ty Cobb ever made it to a World Series after 1909. Yeah, and, even, and the Tigers, as we said last week, continued to have good teams uh, throughout the teams, but just couldn't break through, and, and they continued to have good teams in the 20s, couldn't break through then either. Uh, they were almost always in the first division, almost always over 500, uh, but just never had, really, never really had the dominant pitching that uh, some of the other things did. Yeah. And, and one thing we should say about Ruth as a pitcher even though the park wasn't configured the way it was today, Fenway Park was built before Ruth came to the Red Sox. Uh, the Green Monster it was by, by no means then what it is now, uh, but it still was a tough park for a left-handed pitcher. And it's probably the reason Ruth's uh, f- pitching numbers aren't even greater than they could have been uh, had he been pitching in more of a pitcher's park because uh, he did have that left field, short left field behind him. And, uh, and a lot of space in the right field. Uh, so it was, it was a tough park to pitch in even then. Yeah, in 19, after 1915, the Federal League uh, folded up, and it was that you know, Federal League had sued the uh, uh, National American League under the antitrust rules, uh, and uh, they lost the case. The case was settled, basically, uh, and uh, the uh, the Chicago Federal owner, uh, Wiegum, who had built uh, the park that would become Wrigley Field, was uh, allowed to buy the Cubs. And he moved the Cubs from, uh, I think it was called Northside Park, into Wrigley Field in 1916. And uh, Phil Ball, who owned the St. Louis Federal League team, was allowed to buy the Browns. And he made a little mistake uh, because Branch Rickey was running the Browns at that time. And Branch Rickey uh, and Phil Ball did not get along. So Branch Rickey uh, was fired from the Browns and went over to the, across town to the Cardinals. And uh, <laughs> he took the Cardinals, who probably were the worst franchise overall for the first uh, 20 years of the 20th century in the National League, and uh, turned them into a uh, powerhouse. And, you know, what, one of the things I want to bring out about the Federal League is we cannot underestimate uh, the power of the Federal League has it worked because they eschewed the reserve cause. And a lot of players did jump over, as we mentioned before, uh, to the Federal League. And, uh, yeah, and, with, you know, and there's a whole list here we got. You know, Bo McKechnie and uh, Claude Hendricks and Jack Quinn, Russell Ford, Tom Seaton, Doc Crandall, uh, Al Albert Chase. Well, Tal Chase, High Myers, um, and you had Eddie Joe Fender. Tinker. Yeah, they, they yeah. had some big names. Eddie Plank, you know, the, the, the Eddie, A's deserted en masse after the 14th season. When a number of them jumped to the Federal League. Bender and, Bender and Plank went over, and, uh, you know, that, that's part of what decimated the – uh, federal league, and we also should say something about the probably the most interesting pennant race in, in Major League history occurred in the 1915 Federal League. We talked last year, uh, last week about the 1908 American League race, 
where the Tigers prevailed by half a game over Cleveland. In 1915, the pennant-winning team didn't prevail by any margin of a game. The uh, race ended in a flat-footed tie. If you look at uh, the uh, ga- games games uh, in front or games behind between the Chicago Whales and the St. Louis Terriers, but the Terriers played a full 154-game schedule. The Whales only played 152 games. Uh, so even though the teams ended up uh, in a virtu- in a deadlock as far as games in front, games behind. The Wales prevailed by a single percentage point, and uh, there will never be a closer race in Major League history than the 1915 Federal League. And uh, yeah. the Federal League had, had been a little more stable, had a few more few more owners with their heads in the right place. I think it would have been major trouble for the, for both both the established Major Leagues. Well, it was, happened when uh, they uh, another year or two when they uh, they settled the. Uh, uh, the uh, supposedly settled the suit that uh, the Baltimore team in the Federal League was not satisfied with the suit, and they were the ones who brought the antitrust suit uh, that uh, was decided in 1922, where the uh, the baseball's antitrust exemption was upheld, and that's been a bane of uh, you know bane of uh, contention ever since. Plus, uh, the original suit, I believe that the judge uh, that was assigned to it was Le- Judge Landis. Yeah, And he let, right. uh, instead of uh, forcing a, uh, making a decision, he just let it uh, linger until uh, yeah, there was a negotiation. And, that, but, uh, and he was well, as, a, re- as, a, re- as a, re- a result of what he did with the federal league suit, yeah, uh, why they well remembered by major league yeah. owners when it came time later in the later in the decade to uh, appoint baseball's first commissioner. Well, yeah, 1917 was an interesting year because the White Sox, uh, the Giants won the National League again. The White Sox were basically the same cast that would uh, wind up in infamy two years later. Uh, won the American League and they won the, and they went on to win the World Series. And had not uh, World War One, the 1918, uh, interrupted, and uh, you know they did. If they didn't do what they did in 1919, they might have uh, been a dynasty that would have lasted, lasted for a while. But in 1918, they, as you mentioned earlier, uh, they, uh, the government. Uh, we were in World War One. The government thought it would be longer than it actually turned out to be. The war and they uh, and they. Uh, Shortened the season uh, and ended on Labor Day, and then they had a World Series, as we mentioned last week. That uh, this was the first year the uh, teams, other than the pennant winners, got cuts from the series revenue. They they gave it for the first through fourth place teams, and uh, the players uh, on both teams almost uh, went uh, to strike. I think it was before the fifth game of the World Series there. And there's some people that still believe that the Cubs dumped that series because they were so uh, uh, infuriated with the, uh, you know, the, the doling the money out to the, uh, you know, the uh, other first division teams. So, in fact, I yeah, think there was a lot of book. suspicious act, yeah. a lot of suspicious activity in those years, not only not only around World Series play but on regular season play too. And uh, it's. It, I think in, if any the truth ever came out about, uh, and then of course never will. It's it's far too late for that. But uh, that uh, there were a lot. There were a lot of regular season games dumped, and there certainly were in the minor leagues too, uh, because there's a, there were a, a Pacific Coast League scandal. There yeah, that, 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 there that, were that, minor that, leagues, yeah. and yeah, and there were a lot of players were. Uh, banned or temporarily suspended, and uh, that certainly did not only include the uh, White Sox or what was better known as the Black Sox in some circles, but uh, a lot of major league players who were still active in uh, the late teens in, into into the 1920 season uh, ended up being banned along with the with the Black Sox, and we should, you know, certainly spend some time talking about the. Uh, that scandal and the prelude to it. 
Well, well, basically another thing that happened was that uh, after the Federal League uh, folded up after 1915 and uh, uh, most of them uh, came back to the uh, major leagues, most of the players came back to the major leagues, the owners uh, started slashing salaries again because there was no there was no competition anymore. So, uh, you know, they, they went back to becoming uh, as... Uh, you know, the players went to have, came back to having no rights, and they went back to the teams, and the uh, the uh, the owners started, as I just mentioned, was started slashing salaries again. So we come to 1919. Okay, in 1919, the Reds, who had been uh, pretty mediocre most of the decade, uh, they had a new manager, Pat Moran, who had managed the 1915 Phillies, and they won the National League pennant. Their key player was a Hall of Famer at Roush. And uh, the White Sox, who had won uh, 1917, were uh, back in the toll, and they won, uh, I think, that time fairly easily. And then came the 1919 World Series, which was an infamy for uh, the fact that uh, quite a number of the White Sox uh, threw it. And yeah, that- eight men out. Eight men out, which a lot of people, some people say was uh, not the uh, most accurate count of that. And, uh, but it brought, what eight men out did was it brought it out of the, out of the woodwork. You know, people started talking about it then. And, uh, Ian, would you like to bring anything into this? First of all, um, I'd like to, I had uh, Charles Fountain on my show uh, last year. He published uh, probably the most, uh, David, uh, with new material of the uh, 1919 uh, scandal called The Betrayal. And uh, I don't know if you guys read the book. Uh, no, I've seen it. The no, I'm, so, I'm sorry. What, what, Charles, who was it? Fountain. Hey, yeah. Char- Charles Fountain. He's going to be on my show. Yeah, Charles Fountain. He's up here in Boston. It's called The Betrayal. And he, he no, I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't seen that book. Yeah, it came out last yeah, year. Yeah, tell us about it because that's, yeah. And, uh, you know, and, um, well, first of all, uh, you know, he, he gives the whole, he gives the whole aura, the whole, um, you know, the 1910s, um, you know, it, it was based on new research into archives, newspapers, and transcripts. And, um, what he, what, what struck me the most about the book is how these guys were duped to make a confession, because most of them, including Joe Jackson, uh, was illiterate, and you had the prosecuting attorney, um, you know, grilling these guys for answers, saying, when you in on it, nothing's going to happen to you if you talk. And so, you know, uh, and all that stuff got back to uh, Landis when he was made a commissioner, of course, in 1920, uh, but um, they were not convicted by a court, but overnight, Landis was like, "Well, I'm going to make a, uh, I'm going to make this a, a, uh, a model uh, and an example that uh, even if even plan on gambling on baseball, uh, you know, it's going to there's going to be penalties to pay." This book describes everything, all the gambling that went up to the point. Uh, we have no evidence uh, as we as we um, as we. Um, Go by and, uh, and look at it because we don't know if the World Series was thrown. We can weren't all the confessions either thrown out or lost or something. They, like they, that. they wound up missing. Yeah, yeah, yeah they wound up missing. Peculiarly missing. Yeah, yeah. They went, they went missing, and no one knows where it is to this day. Uh, and, but we did, know did Weaver. Weaver didn't confess, did he? No, Weaver. No. Weaver. Uh, he pl- we, 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 never we, admitted we, to anything. We, we, he played all out, and he he petitioned constantly for reinstatement, and uh, nope, they would never give it uh, give it to him. And um, you know, it was sad because uh, they they didn't even get all the money from uh, the notorious gangster Rothstein, who had uh, I can't remember names off the top of my head, but they had the intermediaries. They went to the White Sox. Hey, Patel, the old boxer, was yeah, very yep. instrumental. Yeah, Austin tested by the trial and uh, never, uh, you know, 
admitted knowing anything. Yeah. Right, uh, and he couldn't prove it, but he went into the hotels, even even months before the World Series. They knew there was going to be a, a fix. Kaminsky, uh, you know, Kaminsky was cheap as anything, as we said. The Federal League folded. The, the reason why they're called the Black Sox wasn't because of the scandal, because uh, he didn't want to even clean their uh, uniforms. That uh, They wanted the players <laughs> to clean their own uniforms. And yeah, there's, Hawaii, there's, I, there's the dispute, really, in how cheap Comiskey was, because, uh, you know, there are a number of historians I know have written uh, very contrasting views that uh, he wasn't any really any cheaper than some of the other owners at the time, and that... Uh, when it was in his best interest, he spent and spent big for ball players, you know, like Collins to get to get Collins. He signed him to a long term contract, and he he he. I think he made the first hundred thousand dollar purchase of a ball player uh, in the year Billy old Cam. when he bought Billy Cam from Billy Cam. Yeah, that was Cam that was that was, a bit li- that was later. That was later after the. Um, was well, after the after the Black Sox scandal, sir? Yeah, but it it did it did. Uh, it certainly countered his image as, as a cheapskate, and um, you know there was just something. You know, I, I'm not I'm not convinced Comiskey was the scoundrel that he's made out to be, and, uh, and a lot of historians have you know taken me to task for even even doubting that. You know, yeah, the, the, there's a was, book I read uh, two years ago uh, by a man named Tim Hornbaker called "Turning the Black Sox White." And basically, uh, what it is is an apology for Comiskey. That's an interesting. I haven't. I haven't. I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah. I, I've I've read that, and it 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 it. Uh, it uh, uh, they said, well, yes, wasn't paid, but uh, you know, these guys were winning. You know, if you had a team like the A's and they were winning forty-five games a year, you, of course, you pay them nothing. You know, back in those days, but if you have a team yeah. that's you know, winning all the time, and you uh, you know don't reward them for that. Uh, you know, I don't know the truths about the warm champagne and the the the, 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 the fact that the you know, the story with Seacott that they wouldn't give him an opportunity to exercise win 30, his, win 30 games. Yeah. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff that is uh, uh, still even up to this day very up in the air, but. Uh, they uh, and uh, you know and Comiskey once he was aware that they had basically dumped the series, uh, got very heavily involved in the cover up. All of a sudden, after 1919, he was signing these guys to three three year deals at substantial raises, and uh, they went through 1920 with the most talent. They were right in the pennant race right? yeah, until the last week broke, of the uh, season. Yeah, broke the last week of the season. And there's speculation that uh, because they were into the gamblers because of the 1919 World Series that uh, they were dumping games occasionally in 1920. If they did, they probably weren't the only team doing it. You know, that, uh, it, was a, it was a very, very difficult era for Major League Baseball. Yeah, uh, the, the yeah. funny, the, the game that uh, broke the scandal wide open had nothing, absolutely nothing to do with them. It was a Cubs-Phillies game. Where the Phillies had this player uh, Lee McGee, yeah, and he scored. He, he wound up scoring a run and a home run in extra innings. He was on base, coming in with the winning run to cost Gamble's money. So uh, they, 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 you know, they got they got him on that, and then all of a sudden the uh, the whole story with the Black Sox came out, and I'm still of the opinion that. Uh, uh, Jackson, Weaver, and uh, uh, Seacott would have been Hall of Famers if that didn't happen, and uh, possibly that their careers had gone out to uh, the uh, you know to, to, to a normal uh, length that uh, possibly Felch and Williams might have put up. Well, with, I don't know. Uh, about, I don't. Know. I, I definitely agree about Jackson, but Seacott was near the end of his career, and Weaver. He was still winning. Really... He was still you know, He won over two hundred games. He, He's still yeah, he did, he did, he did. But so did so did Wilbur Cooper. So did a lot yeah. of pitchers in that era. Did, and and you know, the Weaver at three thirty three in nineteen twenty with the Lively ball. Yeah, and yeah, Jackson, which was a, a huge, huge jump from his previous. Uh, yeah, and Jackson had three eighty two in his last season, which is still yeah the yeah, record for a, a player season. in his last season. Yeah, you know? 
Yeah, he, but, you know, Jackson was unquestionably a Hall of Famer. But, and Ed uh, Roush and some of the other Reds uh, players said that they would have beaten them even straight up. That's how confident they were. Well, they they were they were a good team. They were a solid team. And Pat Moran was a very underrated manager, and uh, he, you know he brought that fifteen Phillies team in when nobody expected it. And the nineteen nineteen Reds were the team nobody nobody thought much of either. And unfortunately, he died very shortly thereafter uh, of severe alcoholism, and uh, it cut short what I think would have probably been a Hall of Fame managerial career. Because uh, he, you know, he really, really knew how to get the most out of out of marginal players. Like Maury Rath had a, you know, outstanding year in 1919, and uh, a real obscure name today. But th- these were key guys. Uh, you know, Greasy Neal was on the 1919 Reds. Ended up as a was NFL there? coach uh, with the yeah. Philadelphia huh. Eagles Hall of Famer. Heine Heine Groh was, was another fine player with the Bonnell bat. Uh, and the pitcher they, they had, had Hot Eller and uh, Slim Sally, who I think had pitched uh, before that for the Giants. Yeah, yeah, they had a lot, a lot, a lot of, a lot of. It was a solid team. It was a solid team throughout. Not a great team, but uh, you know, definitely, you know, good enough to win the pennant that year. And I think they won it fairly and squarely. Uh, I don't know that there was any shenanigans going on in the National League, in particular, maybe individual games between also ran teams, but uh, the cubs Phillies game certainly being one of those, you know, the 1920. And, uh, but, you know, it, it was, it was an interesting time and uh, a lot, oh, it changed, it changed the course of baseball history without question yeah. because of the well, commissioner. Yeah. There's also, uh, when you get into the off season and how Landis was hired, because baseball up to that point was uh, run by a three-man commission. And uh, it was Ben Johnson, who was the czar of the American League, whoever was the National League president at the time, and Gary Gary Herman, Herman. who owned the Reds. And uh, uh, both... Heidler? Heidler was president then? Yeah, I think Heidler was president then. And what happened was... uh, One of the things that happened was... uh, uh, Gary Herman had made enemies among the teams in the National League, and one who particularly hated him was Barney Dreyfus, because uh, when uh, there was a, a contract dispute between the Browns and the Pirates of who was entitled to George Sisler, when he broke in, and uh, Herman cast a deciding vote to give the uh, uh, Sisler to the Browns, and Dreyfus never forgave him for that. And then you had a scene... Uh, in 19, uh, I believe it was 1919, when Carl Mays, because uh, Harry Frazee had bought the Red Sox from Lennon, I think after 1916, and, and uh, Carl Mays had jumped the Red Sox in 1919 because uh, he uh, he was uh, you know a bit of a uh, a little bit uh, crazy to begin with, and he jumped the team because they had made a number of errors behind him. And he said he would never pitch for him again, so he was suspended. And during the suspension, the Reds sold him to the, the Red Sox sold him to the Yankees. But Johnson had a policy where you could not deal players under suspension. And the Yankee ownership, it wasn't Rupert yet at that point. And uh, well, it may have been Rupert and the yeah, Red Rupert, Sox, Rupert was Frazier. There and, uh, yeah, and Frazier. And he- and uh, told Johnson to you know to go to hell, and uh, so did Comiskey uh, because he and, he and Johnson, who were once close friends, got to, had uh, reached the point where their uh, their relationship was not cordial anymore. And the Red Sox, uh, White Sox, and Yankees were prepared to jump to the National League, who they had a 12th team, and the five Amer- remaining American League teams would be stuck out by themselves. So in order to do this, they came up with uh, this, uh, a gentleman, Albert Wasker, who was a big businessman in Chicago, uh, came up with the idea of naming an all-powerful commissioner. And since the game was in a shambles uh, after the uh, after 1919, uh, the owners uh, bowed down to it, and they hired Landis as the commissioner of baseball, giving him absolute power, of course, 
uh, after he passed away, uh, uh, that was the end of the commissioners having absolute power, as we've seen uh, pretty much over the last uh, 70 or so years after, since land was passed. But that's how that happened. And, uh, yeah. yeah, so uh, the structure was maintained. And in 1920, uh, they did away with uh, – they changed the pitching rules. They did away with all the uh, trick pitches. They started bringing in, uh, you know, fresh baseballs constantly the way they do now. And uh, the only pitchers that were allowed to throw spitters were 17 pitchers who were uh, grandfathered. Grandfathered in. Right, and uh, Broy Grimes, who finished up in 1934, was the last of them. But the, because the, and the, and the hitting took over, and the, uh, Ruth, uh, who uh, came the Yankees, uh, hit uh, 50, uh, 54 home runs in 1920 to break his, the record that he had set in 1919 when he was with Boston, hit 29, and the next year he hit. Uh, uh, 59, yeah, 59, and, 59 uh, and, uh, and Ruth was, Ruth's, uh, you know, power was tailor made for the Polo Grounds. Really tailor made. They had the best seasons yeah. in, overall seasons in 1920 and 21. Ian, would well, you like yeah. to add anything to this? I had, uh, Keith Steinberg and Lionel Spatz on my show yesterday. Yeah. They wrote 1921. And then, yeah, I know. I, yeah, I have that. I've read that. I'm, I'm friends with both of them. Yeah, and um, it's not about my dead ball site, but uh, we got into the whole discussion of, uh, you know, why things change. And, of course, we mentioned that you can't spit on the ball anymore. You can't. Uh, you know, the dead ball really was. We've got, we have to bring out the Ray Chapman incident, which had a lot to do with That's the way it. the game changed. And, you know. Yeah. And, yeah, that, that uh, was That's a it. pivotal very pivotal incident in Major League history, and you know, if you if you if you don't mind, I could I could speak yeah. a bit yeah, on that. Yeah, yeah. By the yeah. way, there's a, there's a book that came uh, out. Was, David, before you start, there was a book that came out uh, by an excellent writer named Mike Sowell. Came out in 1990, uh, called "The Pitch That Killed," which is a yeah, total discussion yeah, that was excellent. That book. incident and its yeah. uh, after effects. So go ahead. Yeah, and I, and I, and I, yeah, I strongly recommend it because it did cover the incident very well. But Chapman was Cleveland, Cleveland shortstop. He'd come up in 1912, and he wasn't uh, a, a dominant force at, at the plate, or, but he was an excellent fielder. He got on base a lot. He batted leadoff for Cleveland, and they came into the polo grounds. Uh, and the polo grounds, uh, not, you know, I'm sorry, yeah, it was the polo grounds because the Yankees played in the polo grounds in 1920. Yeah, and uh, Mays was pitching, and Mays was a what was called a submariner, which meant he came, he came, you know, he, he his, brought the ball low to the ground on his delivery, and uh, balls even even though we we talked about this a bit last week, uh, balls stayed in play uh, in the in the early part of the century, and certainly in the uh, eight in the nineteen hundred nineteenth century, long after they should have been removed from play. This uh, 1920. This was still uh, pretty much the case. Balls weren't thrown out with any great regularity. Uh, we don't know the condition of the ball that Mays delivered, but we do know the circumstances. Uh, the Yankees and Cleveland were locked in a tight battle in August. Uh, the center field bleachers were filled with uh, people in white shirts, making uh, making a visual. Uh, you know, de- uh, Almost an invisible impossibility to pick up certain pitches by the batter. Uh, it was a day game, of course. All games were late afternoon. Most games started around three o'clock. Uh, there were shadows, uh, probably at, by that. It was. A, I'm not sure what inning it took place in, but I, I think it was a middle inning or so. And uh, Mays brought in a pitch. Uh, it, it arguable where it was. Some thought it was even a strike, uh, and Matt Chapman crowded the plate, never moved, and the ball the ball hit him squarely in the side of the head in the temple. And uh, although he did manage to stagger toward first base, he collapsed and never he was uh, carried off the field on a stretcher, never recovered consciousness. 
uh, and it was thought that pretty much doomed Cle- Cleveland's chances of winning the 1920 pennant. Uh, by a fortuitous circumstances, they got a shortstop uh, out of the University of Alabama named Joe Sewell late in the season, and he came on strong and helped carry them to the pennant. But the incident did impact on the way uh, baseballs were treated thereafter. We talked about the trick pitches, yeah. the shine ball, the emery ball, <coughs> the spitball being uh, yeah. you know banned except grandfathered <clears throat> those that are grandfathered in, and uh, balls now had to be changed more frequently, and also uh, seating had to be changed. No longer could the uh, center field stands be occupied by people in white shirts, and in most parks they closed off the uh, <clears throat> the center field stands. After that, and of course, ironic is that uh, I think that team has the record for uh, most players on a World Series champion uh, living into their nineties. They have a bunch of them. Uh, I think Wamsgans and uh, yeah, uh, yeah. There's whole uh, whole lot of them. It was, uh, it was a very very but it, yeah, yeah. Kavalevsky. Every, every, yeah, there were a whole bunch of them that wound up living into the. The 90s. Yeah. Uh, I think Sewell did, as, as a matter of fact. And Steve yeah. o- O'Neill lived a long time. And, uh, uh, yeah, they uh, were a, a, a long Joe Joe Wood was on that club. Yeah. He lived a long time. Yeah, they were uh, they were a, a good team. Speaker was was the player manager. Uh, they, but and the uh, as in every uh, time Cleveland participates in a World Series, something bizarre usually occurs. And in the 1920 World Series, we saw uh, the first uh, Grand Slam home run. We saw the only unassisted triple play in a World Series. And I think, didn't Bagby hit a home run? Yeah, there's a first home run by a pitcher. First by home run by a pitcher. pitcher. And Clarence Mitchell, a Dodger pitcher that hit into the unassisted triple play, uh, had hit into a double play earlier. Yeah, in the game. He was responsible for Bill Wamp's chance. Yeah, yeah, Bill Wamsgans turned that triple play and became immortalized thereafter. Even though he really was, he was he was a, a good fielder, good field, no hit second baseman. But uh, his name is still remembered. And I was fortunate enough when I was in high school to have his daughter as a substitute teacher, and also to meet him. And I still am blessed to have his order, autograph on uh, World Series program, no less. But he. And uh, from what he, you know, he had still had vivid memories of the game when I met him and of the World Series. And uh, really great, great experience meeting him and talking to him. Well, if he uh, had done that now, you know, or, you know, even yeah. the, he'd, he'd be able to mark it at the <laughs> way. He'd, he'd be invited to the White House. And yeah, the way, the way Don Lawson has, uh, uh, you know, has, uh, you know, ridden the perfect game uh, to, uh yeah, to, to the point where he's everybody, almost everybody who's a true fan knows who he is, even though his career record was 80, 81 and ninety one. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, you know, it, 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 so it, that was a very very wild. Uh, as uh, I mentioned last week, with uh, this decade, you can go on. For, we can go on forever with it. Uh, One thing we should say about the end of the decade after yeah. the eighteen season when. Uh, baseball was resumed. Uh, it was still shortened in the 1919 season. Uh, they didn't play a full 154 game schedule. Was it 130? Games? 140. Uh, 140. Okay. Yeah. Each team played each other team 20 times. But nevertheless, the World Series was expanded to the best of nine. Uh, so they wanted to get the most out of the. Get yeah, the that lasted for luck. three seasons. Yeah, that lasted yeah. through 1921, and then uh, they realized that this was. Uh, you know, not very uh, well thought out, and they cut it back. But uh, we were talking about uh, the Yankees' ownership. Uh, the the club was sold in 1914 to Rupert and the immortal Colonel Tillinghast Lamadou Lamadou. Houston. Uh, yeah, Houston. Yeah. And, who, 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 uh, uh, he he and Rupert co-owned the club. Uh, he's for, he's forgotten today because he sold out. Uh, yeah, but he was the had, primary designer of Yankee Stadium. Yeah, and he left right after the right after I think right after it opened. He he uh, he, he sold out to to Rupert. The ca- case can be made that he and not Rupert should be the owner of the Yankees in that era. Who should be in the Hall of Fame? But nobody I think, uh, he's Stock, really remembered today. 
I think uh, I think uh, so Ian mentioned Steve Steinberg and Wells Pass the book on that. Ian, like it, right? Yeah, they have the Colonel and the uh, HUD yeah. relationship. The uh, HUD oh, and okay. uh, the Colonel yeah. They were, yeah, they were talking. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that stuff is excellent. The fact that Steve uh, Steinberg just came out of a book on uh, Urban Shocker. Now, I don't know how what kind of an audience he expects to get from that one, because this is a guy who, uh, you know, uh, he was a, he was a very fine pitcher. Pitcher who passed away fairly, fairly early. You know. Yeah, heart failure. And, yeah, I don't know what kind of a market they think that, that this book is going to have, but uh, it was a no, number of number years. This, the, uh, this I mean, is a passion of his. It took him uh, quite a number of years to uh, to uh, uh, yeah to, to to write that book. But uh, this is I a decade. Admire that, him for, yeah, yeah, they have a lot of uh, literature on on and this uh, uh, this decade. Almost every year is covered by. Uh, uh, books, uh, most of them from uh, McFarland, uh, and uh, the Federal League is covered uh, by. There was a book that came out a couple of years ago on the Federal League that won the uh, Larry Ritter Book Award uh, the, that Saber gives out every year, and is a you know a true compendium of uh, uh, the, the comings and goings of that. It's very very fascinating stuff. One thing I do want to mention was that Eddie Plank um, won his 300th game with the St. Louis Terriers, but that wasn't recognized until 1968 uh, when uh, when Major League Baseball finally uh, recognized uh, the Federal League as a competing league. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Huh. No, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. 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 He, was, and he, was, he was the first. He was the first lefty to do that. And... Uh, you know, they, they didn't acknowledge it until 68. Wow, that's Turk, a big... When Turkin and Thompson are at least a 300-game winner, didn't they have Plank among them? I don't know. Uh, I have to... Yeah. This, yeah, I've got to dig that up. But Yeah. Uh, yeah, I always the, thought of him as a kid. I always thought of him as one of the 300-game winners, and I didn't realize he wasn't recognized at Major League. That's, that's, well, he's the only one that's, before... That's interesting. He was the only one before Lefty Grove. Yeah. Right. Uh, yep. Yeah, and um, I got it right here. Um, the Federal League. It's um, it's called this great game where I'm getting this information from. And um, you go to uh, thisgreatgame.com, and um, you will see right in there that I believe, if it's in here, um, that Plank, um, you know, won his 300th game with the St. Louis Terriers. No, I know he did. I know it was with the Terriers. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't recognized until '68. Yep, that was an interesting league. Interesting, and I would, yeah, I would, yeah. If, if I'd been, uh, you know, major league, if I'd been around, then I, I would definitely have tried to go to a federal league game. There's just something about the atmosphere of that league I always liked. <clears throat> As I said, they did get two of their owners into the uh, majors, uh, you know, with the settlement. Uh, yeah, before it closes, there's two, two, two. Uh, off-topic uh, uh, things I'd like to mention. First of all, when they're listing baseball birthdays, uh, one of uh, David's favorite players and one of my favorite players when I was young, Al Rosen, had the misfortune of being born on February 29, 1924. <laughs> so when they're doing baseball birthdays, he skipped all the time. I put something out on the on this in the uh, uh, Sweet 16 site on Facebook, uh, because uh, nobody gave him any recognition. And, uh, he had a real birthday once every four years. I did. I did not know that. That's yeah, that they had on his, uh, you know, uh, cards uh, March first, uh, but uh, you know that was uh, the bunk. And uh, somebody really, was, they put it on his baseball cards. He's born March. Yeah, yeah, because uh, huh. a lot of them in those days, you know, uh, they had uh, the birthday shady the years off. Most of them shaved years, and he, uh, I guess, he gained a full to, day. I yeah, and I decided to make a full day. He's the only prominent ball player that I know was born on February 29th. And the other was I wanted to note the uh, passing of the uh, of Ned Garver last uh, Sunday night at yeah, the age of 91. Yeah. 
who uh, was the last the second pitcher, the last pitcher that went 20 games for a team that lost over 100. And the last pitcher in the American League to win 20 games for a cellar dweller. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he uh, he wound up with a career record of uh, uh, 127 and 159, and he never pitched for a team in 14 seasons that finished above fifth. No, never never broke 500. Never pitched for yeah. That was and he was good. He was good. Yeah. Yeah. And he's one of the handful of players that were teammates of both uh, Satchel Page and Eddie Gaydell. <laughs> well, so, Frank uh, I figured out that anybody who was with him on the Browns in '51 and '52, you know, yeah, with, with well, teammates Frank that he Sarsetti gave out, yeah. alive. So yeah, he, he may be the last surviving uh, member of the Browns when both Frank Sarche. Yeah, Roy Severs is a. Uh, uh, well, well, yeah, Garver left, and I posted this because Bill Carl had posted this. It's a trivia question uh, several months ago. And I nailed most of them. There were nine players left that uh, alive that played in both the 40s and the 60s. Uh, the pitchers that are left are Johnny Antonelli, uh, Bobby Shantz, Kurt Simmons, and Don Newcomb. And the position players are Red Shandrings, Del Crandall, Roy Severs, Johnny Grove, and Wayne Terwilliger, who in 1960 played two games for the Kansas City A's and had one at bat. They're the only, they're the only but, nine. I put this out on Facebook the other day. Not as a trivia question, but as a fact. I put it in the Sweet 16 group. So, Bill uh, Carl is the one who uh, is really responsible for uh, you know, me getting involved with this question. But since I you know, follow that era very, very closely, it, uh, you know, it was, uh, it, it was uh, easy to learn. Tawilla was the only one that, when he asked it, Tawilla was the only one that threw me. I would think it. <laughs> <laughs> I would be amazed if anybody would get that. Yeah, I did not know he played that long. Yeah, yeah I but remember the, him with yeah, the Ant- both Antonelli and Crandall uh, missed the f- uh, 51 and 52 uh, because they were in the military. Yeah. They were both bonus babies in uh, 1949 with the Braves. And uh, you know, when Antonelli signed for, I think it was $65,000, Johnny Singh went and became apoplectic. Was, was Antonelli the last bonus? Was Antonelli the last bonus baby from the forties that played into the sixties? The Crandall was. Crandall was. That's the Simmons. Crandall. Sim- Crandall. Antonelli. Simmons played. Simmons played uh, uh, later than either. Okay. Okay. So they. Okay. Yeah. Simmons was a bonus. I didn't know Crandall was a bonus baby. Huh. Yeah, and Robin Roberts uh, also, uh, but uh, yeah, Robin Roberts is uh, no longer with us, unfortunately. Yeah. But uh, it's, it, 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 it's an interesting thing. Sang went crazy and went apoplectic. He forced them to give him a raise, and then when he started to lose it in 1951, they shipped him to the Yankees for Luber death. Okay, any last words yeah. by anybody? Ian, you have anything to add? No, I don't. I think it was a great show. I'm, I'm glad that uh, I'm glad Dave uh, gave the whole uh, thing with the, uh, the ball, and that's very important uh, because uh, – you know we're gonna we're moving into the live ball now, and uh, that's what uh, I guess we'll talk about next week. Yes, yeah, so, okay. Same bad time, same bad channel. Thank you, John. Thank I, you. Cer- I certainly Thank learned you. something today. I have quite a few things. I really enjoyed it. Okay, hey. I think it went very very well. So I'll, I'll know from my Ralph that we did this, and hopefully it'll be up t- tomorrow. Good. That's hey. good. Okay. Take All care, right. gentlemen. See you next All week. Right. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye.